Side Hustle Show 256. This is my bootstrapped business idea brain dump. Eight business models you can borrow with zero or even better than zero startup costs. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show because starting a life-changing business doesn't have to cost a life-changing amount of money. Special solo show for you this week as I'm diving into one of my favorite topics, analyzing interesting business models. I know, it's exciting stuff. The reason for this episode is that money is one of the big three obstacles that comes up when I ask people what's holding them back, as in I don't have enough startup capital to get my side hustle off the ground. The other two that come up in the big three are time and ideas, which is why productivity is a kind of a recurring theme on the show and ideas. We talk about different side hustle ideas every week. So I wanted to run through a few uh, specific business models with zero or even better than zero startup costs. You're going to learn about companies that sell ideas, companies that sell other people's products without having to pay for them, and even companies that get paid to buy their inventory or raw materials. Plus, we'll look at some online and service business models that I like with no overhead or with very low overhead. Stay tuned for those eight business models, as well as a rundown of the startup costs of every one of my businesses, at least the ones that I can remember. Notes and links for this one are at sidehustlenation.com slash bootstrapped. Before we dive in, let me take a moment to thank our sponsor, Upside.com. Book your next business trip on Upside and get rewarded. This is really cool. So I just got back from a business trip uh, from FinCon, actually, and I wish I'd heard of Upside before I booked. Now, why is that? Because on top of the best available prices for flights, hotels, and rental cars, Upside gives you a gift card to places like Amazon.com for every trip you book. Give it a try today at Upside.com and use the code SIDEHUSTLE to get a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com when you book your next business business trip. That's upside.com for more rewarding business travel and promo code side hustle for that minimum $100 gift card on your first trip. Minimum purchase is required. Please see site for complete details. I'd also like to thank Design Crowd for sponsoring this episode. Design Crowd is the crowdsourced design platform. You can use them for logos, websites, business cards, t-shirts, you name it. It's the service that I use to create the book cover for my latest book, Buy Buttons, where after submitting my design brief, I had a dozen different designers from all around the world competing for my business. I thought that was pretty sweet. As a side hustle show listener, you can get up to $100 off your next design project at designcrowd.com slash hustle or with promo code hustle at check. Out. And actually, if you hit that URL, designcrowd.com slash hustle, you should be able to see some of the rejected designs for buy buttons. It's kind of like walking down a parallel universe of what might have been. I'll be back with my personal startup costs for all my businesses I can remember from over the last 20 years. But first, the eight business models you can start today for next to nothing. Ready? Let's do it. What if you could sell something that cost you nothing? That's like finding money on the ground, right? The first couple examples I have are kind of silly, but I want to share them anyway to get your creative juices flowing because these are real people, real companies, earning real money, selling stuff based on perceived value. And if you dig deeper, I think that's pretty much what all transactions are based on. So number one is the perceived value plan. And actually the, the company that comes to mind or the example that comes to mind is actually the inspiration for all of this under the perceived value plan. And that is the International Star Registry. Have, have you heard of these guys? They've been around for decades. Since 1979, they've been selling the naming rights to stars. It's like a cute gift. You can look up in the sky and you can say, well, that one's named after your girlfriend or your dog or your grandma or whoever. And they've sold more than a million of these things. In fact, you can go uh, buy one today at starregistry.com. It's a cool business because there's basically unlimited inventory, 400 billion stars, however many is out there. And the cost of goods sold is zero. The company is going to send you a certificate and a little map of the sky so you can go uh, help you find your star. But they don't pay royalties to NASA or anything for the naming rights. They're selling something that costs them nothing under the perceived value plan. The next example I want to share comes from someone who's actually a guest on the show in episode 171. Of course, I'm talking about Jason Zook, who earned over a million dollars wearing branded t-shirts at IWearYourShirt.com. He started out charging just a dollar, but ramped up his rates as his following and his reach grew. And of course, it didn't cost him anything aside from his time to market the idea. On the podcast, we talked about how to get sponsorships for your blog, your podcast, or your event even if you're just starting out. So what could you sell on the perceived value plan? That was uh, business model number one. Business model number two is what I'll call the deal maker model. The deal maker model 
has kind of a similar marketing angle to Jason's t-shirt business, but it's geared at consumers. And the best example that comes to mind is restaurant.com. Restaurant.com is an innovative business that sells gift certificates to local restaurants at a deep discount. And their normal price is $10 for a $25 certificate, but sometimes you can find promotions where they'll say, um, well, they'll sell you that same $25 gift certificate for just like three bucks. So $25 worth of food for three bucks is a tremendous value proposition for customers, even after, you know, there's some fine print and there's some usage restrictions like, okay, you got to order at least $40 worth of food and, you know, you can't, it doesn't include takeout, doesn't include beverages and stuff like that. So how can restaurant.com afford to do that? It's simple. It doesn't cost them anything. They're selling their gift certificates to these other restaurants and pocketing all the money. It's like a marketing uh, arrangement for the restaurant. So they don't have to uh, share revenue with uh, with the restaurants themselves. And that means, you know, whatever they charge for the gift certificate, they get to keep 100% of the proceeds. The restaurants are essentially giving away these $25 gift certificates to get people in the door. So why is a restaurant going to sign up for this, this quote, service? Um, lots of reasons, right? You, know, you can attract new customers. You can help fill empty tables. If you have kind of a large fixed cost operations, you can fill, you know, help get up to capacity. You could attract larger parties. You know, somebody comes in with a group of eight people, you know, giving them 25 bucks off their, their bill is not a huge ask. Um, you could get feedback. Hey, do people like our recipes? You know, get, get some people in the door. And uh, it can give the customer or give the restaurant an online presence, which admittedly was probably more of a selling point back in, I think, 1999 when restaurant.com started before every restaurant kind of had a website on their own. But of course, if you're trying to do reputation management, you're trying to obviously more digital real estate is, is usually better than less. And for restaurants, they have, they have to compare their cost of acquisition relative to other forms of advertising. So relative to coupons or radio advertisements or other forms of marketing, restaurant.com might actually be a cheaper method of customer acquisition than other forms of marketing for the restaurants. So I think this business model is similar to uh, the Groupon or Living Social model. So the question is, under the dealmaker model, could you sell discount vouchers for somebody else's service to help them acquire customers? Could you pivot the restaurant.com model to another niche? All right, now that we've got the ball rolling, we've got our creative muscles engaged, I want to introduce one business model that I think is really cool, and that's the email list, right? It's crazy simple, super cheap, or even free to start, and it can grow into a serious business. I actually have two flavors uh, under this email list business that I'm thinking of. Number one is the connector, and number two is the curator. So we'll do the connector side first. So on the connector side, the example that comes to mind is helpareporter.com. Every day, they send three emails connecting journalists with sources. It's free to join. There are currently 800,000 sources signed up. I'm one of them and more than 50,000 journalists. And I've actually used Haro as both a source and a journalist. I think it's a cool tool. Like when I was looking for stories to include in in the buy buttons book it was last year when i connected with alexandra kennan from urbanhikersf.com uh, through help a reporter we ended up doing a podcast episode as well that was uh, 193 if you want to check it out so how help a reporter makes money is selling ads in the emails so anytime you can build a list that size especially if it's somewhat targeted you can bet there are companies that are willing to pay to get in front of those people so in the case of Helper Reporter, it was founded in 2008 by Peter Shankman and sold a couple years later for an undisclosed sum. One writer on Quora said it sold for $1.6 million, but I couldn't verify that number. In any case, I'm sure it was a nice payday, all for playing connector. The other connector example that I have is a smaller one, but follows a similar model. It's called Podcast Guests. Dot com, which, as you might guess from the name, connects podcast hosts with people who want to be guests on their shows. It's free to join and guests can pay for featured placement in the emails. So the question is, are there two groups of people you could connect through an email list? The next flavor of email list business is the curator model. And these are lists like The Skim, uh, which my wife loves, Thrillist, um, and the one that recently found its way into my inbox is The Hustle. The writers for The Hustle are awesome, and it shares kind of the day's worth of startup news in a funny and informative way. So they sell ads in the emails, kind of like the helper reporter model, and they've even branched out to have a live event in Oakland called HustleCon, and I'm a little bummed they took the name of my future X conference, but good for them. They're rocking the curator model. And another email list 
that I'm on under this category is is called Startup Mixtape, where they send podcast summaries of the top business shows every week. It's like Cliff's Notes for your favorite podcasts. It's got, um, you can check it out at startupmixtape.fm. So if there's an industry that you can't stop talking about, that might make for a good curator model email list business. Now, how about in the realm of physical products? The next business model I have is called One Man's Trash is Another Man's Treasure. And the first thing that comes to mind here is watching the free section of Craigslist or your local equivalent to see if anything valuable pops up. The downside is you have to be on it all the time since obvious arbitrage opportunities are going to disappear super fast. So I want to share the story of another business that turns trash into treasure and actually gets paid on both ends of the deal. A few years ago, I connected with a company called EcoScraps, which sells organic compost and potting soil. And the story goes like this. Co-founders Craig Martineau and Dan Blake are at this all-you-can-eat buffet in uh, Provo, Utah, and they are just blown away by how much food ends up in the garbage. So they started EcoScraps to collect food waste from restaurants and grocery stores and turn it into organic healthy compost. Because each year, more than 34 million tons of food is wasted. In, in the United States alone. And most of this rotting food ends up in landfills where it releases methane, a very potent greenhouse gas. And so EcoScraps is able to salvage some of that food and use it as a raw material to create their eco-friendly compost. And then they turn around and sell that because professional composting, I'm told, as opposed to allowing food to rot in landfills, doesn't release methane. Normally, food service companies like um, restaurants and grocery stores pay a garbage hauler to take their food waste away. For a lower fee, EcoScraps CEO Dan Blake explained, quote, we'll take it off their hands and keep it out of the landfill. Our suppliers actually save money in the process and even get a little bit of green cred out of the effort, end quote. In the deal, EcoScraps sources its raw materials for better than free, which makes it such a unique and innovative and attractive business. Any other business models that get paid to buy their raw materials? Uh, the other one that comes to mind is a junk hauling service. Like the homeowner pays you to come pick up a bunch of stuff they no longer want, and then you're free to resell any of it that might be worth something. By the way, back in 2012, EcoScraps was named one of the top 25 most promising social ventures by Business Week, and they've already diverted more than 170 million pounds of food waste from landfills. So how about that for the one man's trash is another man's treasure business model? The other option to consider on kind of a smaller scale would just be to do a consignment type of uh, operation in your neighborhood. You could start, go around and put up flyers. You can ask your neighbors, like, do you have anything that you'd be willing to donate or you kind of have in line for your next garage sale or whatever, but you don't want to be bothered with it? Look, I'll, I'll take that. I'll sell that for you on Craigslist, on eBay, wherever, and then I'll just give you a cut and you might find some takers for that. Business model number six is repackaging because sometimes it's just about the packaging. Bottled water is probably the most famous example of this. Like if you look at the label on almost all of them, they say the water comes from municipal sources. That means tap water and then it gets filtered and they put it in a fancy bottle and then they sell it for like a ridiculous markup. But bottled water companies aren't the only ones taking something that's free or super cheap and repackaging it. One example I found that I thought was a cool idea is this little uh, MP3 player that's loaded up with 100 classic books. All the books are so old that they're in the public domain, so the company just hired narrators to create audiobooks for them. And again, selling something that was free, inventory that was free for them to acquire. And the last example I have on the physical product side is uh, the subscription box model. Now, we heard from Sam Gonzalez in episode 246 that not all subscription boxes work this way, but a lot of companies see them as advertising opportunities and will essentially donate or give you a really steep discount to include a sample sized package of their product in the box. It's a marketing expense for them, free or very cheap inventory for you, and a novel new product to check out for your customers. All right, we've talked about online business, we've talked email, we've talked physical products. Now, how about service businesses? Because freelancing and service businesses are typically the first thing that comes to mind when you think of super low startup cost business models. And of course, there's a ton of great freelancing material in the Side Hustle Show archives. But I want to share a few examples of service businesses that I think have an innovative approach. The first couple fall under what I'll call the pay for performance model. So this is number seven, pay for performance model, where not only did the company have super low startup costs, they gave their customers super low startup costs too, saying, look, we only want to get paid if we deliver results. 
The first is a company I've been working with for a few years called BillCutters.com, Bill Cutters with a Z, which tries to negotiate better deals on your utilities, your TV, your internet, your home security. If they can't save you any money, you won't pay them a cent. But if they do manage to save you some cash, they take a percentage of their savings as their fee. So there's no risk, and some customers report saving $500 or more in a year. Another company I discovered using this tactic is Babelcube. It's a book translation service. How it works is they offer to translate your book into a foreign language and publish it in that market completely for free. And the hook is they earn a royalty split on whatever copies they sell on your behalf. And the last example I have under the pay for performance model is a Facebook marketing service called Growth Ninja. Again, I haven't tested these guys personally, but heard about them on another podcast where their fees are just based on the leads or sales they generate for you. You decide what a new customer is worth, and then they go out and get as many as they can for you at that price. I thought it was pretty cool stuff. Is there a way to add a risk-free element to your service offering? Let me know in the comments for this episode at SideHustleNation.com slash bootstrapped. Now, business model number eight is um, under the freelancing umbrella, and I'm calling it the agency model. I think this was exemplified by my recent chat with Russ Perry of designpickle.com, which offers unlimited graphic design for a low fixed monthly price. Russ told me he sucked at design. It was about connecting customers with designers. Now, his overhead grew as the company scaled to $400,000 a month. But at the beginning, it was about finding a customer and then finding somebody to go do the work, do the design work. I don't want to say it was that simple, but it was. It also wasn't that complicated. The agency model bootstrapped with cash flow from customers. And the last example I have is a similar take on that. This is where you take a fragmented industry with a lot of small operators and try and build a premium brand using those small operators as your service providers. And the company I have in mind to illustrate this is Belay, like a climbing Belay. It's B-E-L-A-Y solutions.com. They looked at the domestic virtual assistant industry and saw a lot of work from home solo assistants and saw an opportunity to create a premium brand around them. It works like any other agency. You earn a profit on the spread between what you bill your clients and what your workers bill you. But now Belay has hundreds of assistants and even made the 2015 Inc. 500 list. And everybody still gets to work from home. So is there an industry or a niche that's ripe for consolidation or where you see there's room for a premium entry into the market? With both Design Pickle and Belay, you've got very low overhead to start and just need to play connector between clients and service providers. Booking business travel at Upside.com is a triple win. Win number one is that Upside has great prices for flights, hotels, and rental cars. Win number two is that Upside will reward you with a gift card to places like Amazon.com every time you buy a business trip. And win number three is the amazing six-star treatment you'll get from Upside's customer service specialists who they call navigators. For example, one recent Upside customer had a flight canceled, and while he was rebooking his flight, a navigator proactively contacted the hotel and had them change his check-in day without charging any fees. That's pretty nice, right? And that's just one example of how Upside navigators go above and beyond for business travelers. They're like your own uh, personal travel concierge at no extra charge, and they're accessible 24-7 by voice, chat, uh, email, or or message on the Upside app. And I'm going to start your six-star Upside treatment right now. You can go to Upside.com and use my code SIDEHUSTLE and you'll get a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com. That's code SIDEHUSTLE for a minimum $100 gift card to Amazon.com when you buy your next business trip at Upside.com. Upside.com for a better business trip, minimum purchase required, see site for complete details. All right, so we went through the eight zero or better than zero startup cost business models. And to recap, those were the perceived value plan, the deal maker model, the connector email model, the curator email model, one man's trash is another man's treasure, repackaging, the pay for performance model, and the agency model. But let's check out some of the startup costs for every one of my businesses. This goes back 20 years. So when I was 15, I sold some candy at summer camp. This is Boy Scout summer camp to, to date myself. And I remember going to Costco with mom. So mom probably fronted the cash for this. And hopefully I paid her back, but probably bought 20 bucks worth of candy and was able to turn around and flip it at summer camp for you probably doubled the money, right? You could undercut the trading post that was there and you were more convenient because, you know, everybody was at your campsite instead of like having to walk down the trail to, uh, to the general store or to the trading post. 
A few years later, I started a painting business, and the startup cost for that was really the truck that I bought. It was a $3,500 truck, a 1991 Toyota pickup, which was like half of my net worth at the time, but I also got the truck out of the deal, which had some resale value. Later on in college, I started a real estate investing business. It was a few thousand dollars in training uh, for that, which in retrospect was kind of the thing you could you could probably find on your own in, in books. But I was young and wanted some hand-holding from people who were really doing it. And I invested some of the profits from the painting business into that training. And what happened was the training and the motivation from having invested in it did get me off the sidelines and into my first deal. It was a lease option property that had disaster written all over it. And I got out, thankfully, just before the crash and made some money on it. But it was definitely an example of sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. After that, I started the shoe business, which I've talked about before. It was $5 at the time to open a Google AdWords account, which I think now it's free to do that. Um, I started off with a budget of a dollar a day to try and validate that people were going to buy shoes through these links. And then once I had done that, several months later, is when I went on guru.com and found a, a developer to help build out the site and build the database and kind of program all the stuff that I had in mind for this comparison shopping engine that you know was in my mind the way to scale the little direct link uh, building business uh, that I had going. While I was running the shoe business, I started a handful of other affiliate sites which ranged in startup costs from you know ten dollars for a domain name to a hundred dollars for some you know theme customizations and stuff like that all the way up to you know five thousand dollars for you know, more advanced programming stuff. And most of those sadly kind of flopped, but a few of them are still, you know, are still running today, are still generating some income today. Side Hustle Nation, this is the one that's near and dear to my heart, cost me a hundred bucks for the domain. I had to buy the domain secondhand. Somebody had started a site on sidehustlenation.com and they weren't doing anything with it. So I was like, I think I made them an offer and they were like, all right, deal. So a hundred bucks for the domain, 60 bucks for the podcast, Mike, uh, that I'm spe still speaking into today, four years later, four and a half years later, uh, $15 for the first month of podcast hosting. I spent 15 bucks on Fiverr for the original voiceover intro and outro music. And in like, if I'm being honest, it's probably the best 200 bucks I ever spent. Like that's been a totally life-changing project. So uh, very low startup cost, very low investment on uh, on that front. And it's been awesome, tons of fun. I started a recruiting business shortly after that, which was $0, and then later it put down, I think, $49 a month to access a job board. I started a freelance writing business for $0. I got my first clients on Fiverr. I started an Amazon FBA business, you know, turning the retail arbitrage thing. I think I spent probably a couple hundred bucks in the first uh, few weeks on inventory there, but really not a lot of correlation between the startup cost and the eventual success or failure of the business. But obviously, the cheaper you can get something off the ground, the less financial risk you have. Notes and links for this one are at sidehustlenation.com slash bootstrapped. That's it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of The Side Hustle Show, where you'll learn affiliate marketing from one of the best in the business. My chat with Michelle Schroeder-Gardner from makingsenseofsense.com. Coming up next week. I'll see you then. Hustle on. Thanks for listening to the Side Hustle Show at www.sidehustlenation.com.